An ATR-72 has four main wheels, and each main wheel has a brake. The airplane can be dispatched with one brake inoperative. What can possibly go wrong? Hello aviators, how are you today? My name is Magnar Nordahl, I am an ATR captain and instructor. This video is about a serious incident that happened with an ATR-72 at Ilorin Airport in Nigeria in November 2014. The Accident Investigation Bureau, AIB, released the final report eight years later, in December 2022. Considering the long time it took to produce the report, you should expect it to be comprehensive and cover all aspects of the incident. But I have to say the report is disappointing because many questions are not answered. Apparently, there has been no investigation and there are no safety recommendations. But there are lessons to be learned. The airplane was an ATR-72-200 registered 5 November Bravo Papa Golf, belonging to Overland Airways. The company is based in Lagos, the largest city in Nigeria. The company started operations in 2002 and the fleet consists of ATR-42, ATR-72 and Beechcraft 1900. The captain of the flight was 61 years and had a total flying experience of 14,485 hours. He had 8,600 hours on the type, whereof 7,780 hours as commander. On this flight, he was pilot flying. The first officer was 39 years and had a total of 1,520 hours, whereof 1,240 hours on the type. He was pilot monitoring. So we are talking about a very experienced captain with a fairly experienced first officer. The aircraft was built in 1993 and had accumulated 37,000 hours and 45,000 landings. On the day before the incident, the brake on main wheel number one, that is the outer left wheel, was reported inoperative. In the minimum equipment list, the brake is uh, listed as category C repair interval. That means it must be repaired within 10 days. And out of the four brakes installed, three must be operative. The conditions for dispatch are A. The anti-skid system must be operative. B. The affected brake must be deactivated by maintenance. And C. AFM performance penalty must be applied. The AFM is the Airplane Flight Manual. Here we see that the Accelerate Stop Distance, ASD, must be increased by 1.1. V1 must be not more than 0.8 of V1 for maximum brake energy. And the Landing Distance must be increased by 1.1. On this flight, the performance penalties were not limiting because the aircraft was operated on long runways. Overland Airways Flight 1186 was from Nigeria's capital Abuja to Ilorin. I have flown this route many times before for another operator, and the video clips you see here are from my flights. The accident flight departed at 15.43 local time with 59 passengers and 4 crew. The takeoff weight was 20 tons. The weather in November is dry and often hazy. But on this day, the visibility was very good and the winds were very light. In other words, it's a perfect day for flying. Seven minutes into the flight, there was a <laughs> an hydraulic message on the crew alert panel. On the overhead panel, there was a low level message for the blue hydraulic system. The aircraft has two hydraulic systems. They are called blue and green. Low level means that there is less than 2.5 liters fluid left in the reservoir for the associated system. The checklist 
tells you to switch off the blue pump and the auxiliary pump. Despite the crew later stated they did perform the checklist, they did not switch off the pumps. And as a consequence, when the tank was empty, there was a low pressure alert for the pump. Without the blue hydraulic pressure, the aircraft has lost flaps, spoilers, nozzle steering and propeller brake. And the parking brake cannot be charged anymore. Without flaps, the landing distance is 2.2 times longer than normal. Um, for example, at 20 tons, the normal landing distance is 695 meters. So that was not an issue. Loss of nose steering is a concern, but you can use asymmetric reverse and braking for directional control. The runway at Ilorin is 3000 meters long and 60 meters wide and this gives an extra margin. Therefore, I understand why the crew selected to continue to the destination. However, when they arrived in Lorin, they did not inform ATC about the hydraulic failure. It's always a good practice to inform ATC about failures that might affect the control or performance of the aircraft. Anyway, they were cleared for approach, but then, after selecting the landing gear down, the crew received another alert. Green hydraulic low level. The crew informed ATC about the problem, aborted the approach and entered a holding pattern to do the checklists. This was a very good decision because now they had lost both hydraulic systems. The green system powers the landing gear and the normal brakes. The landing gear has a manual extension system, but once the landing gear is down, it is not possible to retract it. Loss of normal brakes means the pilots must use the emergency brake, which is supplied by an accumulator. But for a long runway, you really don't need to brake much. We use reverse to slow down the aircraft, and the brakes are only needed for the last part to bring the aircraft to a full stop. The crew did a checklist for both hydraulic systems loss and the landing distance was now increased to 2.6 times the normal landing distance, but the runway was still long enough. The checklist says reverse as required, brake handle, emergency as required. But did the captain remember that one of the brakes was inoperative? When you're using the emergency brake, the hydraulic pressure from the accumulator is distributed equally to all brakes. But with one brake inoperative, in this case on the left side, the aircraft will drift to the right. The landing weight was 19.4 tons and the crew would use the landing space for 20 tons. We always round it up. Without flaps, the approach speed will be 143 knots. The transcript from the flight data recorder shows that the aircraft touched down on runway 05 at 1542 and 2 seconds. Shortly after landing, the power levers were moved to ground idle, where they remained until the aircraft had stopped. The reverse was not used. The crew applied emergency brake and the rudder was used for direction control. When the speed decreased below 70 knots, the rudder lost the efficiency and the aircraft veered to the right. It left the runway at low speed and hit a ridge in the grass. This caused the nose gear to collapse. The nose gear is located under the pedestal and the collapsed nose gear jammed the condition levers so the crew could not stop the engines. Therefore they used the fire handles to stop the engines. Nobody was injured, the aircraft was evacuated and the passengers collected the bags and went home. The next day the investigators from AIB arrived in Lorraine Airport and found the aircraft with the flaps fully down. The nose gear collapsed, 
the flap lever at 30 degrees position, the power levers at flight idle position, and the condition levers at minimum RPM position. This is not exactly what you would expect to see. The aircraft landed without flaps, so why was it found fully done the next day? It was not because the lever was set to 30. The only explanation I know is that there must have been a leak in the flap valve block. When you move the flap lever, the MFC, multifunction computer, sends a signal to the flap valve block, which controls the flow of hydraulic fluid to the flap actuators. The hydraulic pressure in the lines will keep the flaps in the selected position. A leak in the flap valve block will cause the flaps to move down by gravitation force when the aircraft is parked on the ground, or when in flight, the flaps will be pulled up by the lower air pressure of the wing when it produces lift. The latter might be dangerous during takeoff and approach, and a flap unlock warning is installed to alert the crew if that happens. Here is a picture of a parked ATR-72 where the flaps is kept in retracted position. This is the normal condition. And here is another parked ATR-72 where the flaps has moved down, and the most probable cause is a leak in the flap valve block. And just to be clear, the position of the flaps lever has nothing to do with the position of the flap in this situation. Without hydraulic pressure, the flaps will not move when you select a new position. The accident report stated that the investigation could not determine the cause of the hydraulic system malfunction. When you have a loss of hydraulic fluid, it's because of a leak. In this case, two leaks. And here is another point. Why didn't the captain use reverse to slow down the aircraft? Reverse is very effective at high speeds, and since they landed without flaps, they had a quite high landing speed and the runway was very long. So why didn't they use reverse but apply the emergency brake right away? The report doesn't answer this, and I think this is a very important question. As I said in the beginning of this video, the final report from the AIB leaves many questions unanswered. It states that the crucial factor was loss of directional control on ground due to the aircraft being dispatched with one brake inoperative and loss of both hydraulic systems in flight. Contributory factor, inappropriate application of standard operating procedures, SOP, following the display of hydraulic low level indication of the blue hydraulic system shortly after takeoff. The report states that the pilots didn't switch off the hydraulic pumps as required by the checklist, but this didn't affect the outcome of this incident. Therefore, I disagree with this point. What the report missed is that the use of the emergency brake resulted in loss of directional control. Did the investigators talk with the pilots? I don't know. The report hardly mentions any statements from the pilots, neither is there any transcript from the cockpit voice recorder, and no safety recommendations were made. So, what can we learn from this? First of all, when you accept an aircraft with a defect according to the minimum equipment list, you are legally good to go. But you must be aware of how this can affect the operation of the aircraft. In some situations, you might find it okay. In other situations, it might not be okay for you. It's up to the commander to decide whether to accept the aircraft or not. In this case, I would have accepted the aircraft and fly with one brake inoperative because the airports have long runways. Therefore, an increased stopping distance would not be an issue. Besides, in most situations, we use reverse to slow down the aircraft after landing. Losing both hydraulic systems is very rare. This is something we do during simulated training, but we don't combine this with a single brake failure. 
So the crew experienced a totally new scenario. Did the captain consider the inoperative break when he briefed the approach? We don't know. Sadly, the report didn't discuss human factors at all. When the second hydraulic system failed, the workload must have increased. And when the workload increases, we tend to focus on fewer items. It's easy to get tunnel vision. It's easy to miss important information. And if we rush, things might get even worse. This crew did not use reverse, but they used emergency braking. And that didn't go well. When the aircraft started to turn to the right, the crew still had the opportunity to regain control by releasing the brake and apply reverse on the left engine. But if you are not prepared for this, you might not find a solution in time. On the positive side, the speed was very low when they left the runway and nobody was hurt. Knowing your aircraft is always a good thing that enables you to determine the outcome of your actions. Even more important is to take time to analyze the situation before you act. Take a deep breath, come slowly to 10, look around, and make sure your colleague understands the situation and agree with your analysis. Then you can act. And that's all for this time. Thank you for watching. Have a wonderful day and happy learning.